If you caught my video that I uploaded earlier this week, I talked about the Bulls five worst trades in franchise history and this idea actually sparked from a subscriber who asked me to do a video on the Bulls top five trades of all time and because right off the bat I started thinking of bad trades that the Bulls have made, I went in a different direction and put that video together first. So rather than taking the negative route in this one, in this video I'll be discussing the top five trades that the Bulls have made in franchise history and you guys, you'll probably be seeing more of of these type of videos in the off season since it's not like there's going to be any breaking news happening all the time or games to cover i'll likely make this more of a bulls top five series on a given topic and i'll put in a playlist for that for easy viewing so what's going on everyone you are listening to bulls sensual here hope you're all doing well so in the history of the NBA, there have been thousands of trades made over the years. Some that were fair trades that benefited all parties involved. Uh, some were completely lopsided in favor of one party over the other, and some that just didn't make any sense at all. And despite the Bulls front office making a lot of bad trades that ultimately didn't benefit the franchise, like the five that I mentioned in my video earlier this week, which I'll leave linked below, and it'll be on the end screen in case you missed it. But despite the front office's relative incompetence, they did also make some pretty noteworthy trades in which they definitely benefited from and getting the better end of the deal in terms of who they traded with. Now, a quick call out. These are only going to be trades I will be ranking in this video, not draft picks, free agency acquisitions, just trades. Also, I am ranking these trades based on how uneven they were in terms of the wideness of the margin that was in favor of the Bulls versus the team that they traded with. Now, I'll start with a few honorable mentions that didn't quite break my top five, and I'll start with the Bulls trading Cameron Bearstow. Yeah, remember him? Most people don't. He was the Bulls' second round pick in the 2014 draft and played all but 18 games in his entire NBA career, was never really a good player, and quite frankly, never belonged in the NBA. And somehow the Bulls pulled off a trade of sending Bearstow to the Pistons for a guy by the name of Spencer Dinwiddie. The, yes, the Bulls had Dinwiddie on their team, but as amazing as this trade was in hindsight, knowing the player that we know Dinwiddie is today, the Bulls blew it by not keeping him and waving him before the start of the season. The only time we were able to see Dinwiddie in a Bulls uniform was during the preseason. The next honorable mention, and this one pains me to say because it involves our guy Stacy King, but in the 1994 offseason, the Bulls, after years of hoping Stacy King would live up to his high draft selection, and he just never really panned out to being the big man that they needed him to be, and in that season, they made the decision to move on and trade him for a young Luke Longley, who of course uh, ended up being the focal center during that second three-peat run from 96 to 98. And then finally, a last honorable mention, in 2009, the Bulls decided to trade a declining Andres Nocioni, and actually a few other guys, Drew Gooden and Cedric Simmons as well, to the Sacramento Kings in exchange for Brad Miller and John Salmons. And both Brad Miller and John Salmons, particularly Salmons anyway, were very key pieces to those early D Rose Bulls years to get them into the playoffs and putting them on a path to success as an up and coming team. I actually love John Salmons on that Bulls team. I thought he brought some great scoring to pair alongside Rose, given, you know, Ben Gordon was no longer on that team. Uh, but the Bulls didn't hang on to Salmons for very long. Uh, but the Bulls definitely fared better in this trade than the Kings did, judging by how quickly Nocioni fell off after getting moved. All right, so let's get into the top five trades in Bulls franchise history. And at number five, we have the Bill Cartwright trade. Now, initially, this trade was met with a lot of skepticism because the Bulls traded one of the fans' favorite players in Charles Oakley, who was a true enforcer on the court but after getting beat by the Pistons for years in the 80s the Bulls decided it was time to bring in a big man center who could combat the bad boy Pistons and they made the trade and traded away Charles Oakley to the Knicks in exchange for Bill Cartwright and of course Cartwright was the Bulls starting center in those th first three championship seasons in 91, 92, and 93 and if you watch the Last Dance documentary that came out last year Michael Jordan himself stated they would not have been able to get past the Pistons if it wasn't for Bill Cartwright and yes Oakley still went on to play well with the Knicks and overall was a really great player but I don't think you can underestimate the importance importance of that trade for the Bulls in leading to their eventual title runs. At number four, the Jimmy Butler trade. Now, 
Since this one is more fresh in people's minds, I'm sure there are going to be a lot of people who disagree that this is one of the better trades made in franchise history. I'm sure there will be some that would argue this should actually be in one of the worst trades in franchise history, but let me explain. So in the 2017 season, the Bulls disappointed in barely squeaking into the playoffs with an all-star in Jimmy Butler, a former all-star in Dwayne Wade and Rajon Rondo. And despite a disappointing season finishing with the eight seed, the Bulls look poor and actually upsetting the number one seeded Boston Celtics in the first round after they won the first two games in Boston. But then Rondo injured his hand, which sidelined him for the rest of the series. And despite the Bulls having the best player in this series in Jimmy Butler, Butler could not get the Bulls to win another game in that series. And the Bulls ended up losing four straight after that. And the series was over in six games. Now, as much as I like Jimmy Butler and always defended the guy, that was not a good look for him. I know there is, you know, a such thing as playoff Rondo. And yes, you could argue the Bulls, they weren't really constructed in a way that they could have done well regardless but after going up 2-0 and going back to Chicago you couldn't lead your team to a single victory or closing out the series all because Rondo got injured the only other thing about Jimmy Butler as I'm sure most remember he wasn't the best locker room guy he often clashed with players with coaches if he felt that you know he People weren't working hard enough. And Jimmy, although had an incredible energy, a drive and a hustle on the court, he would get defeated and frustrated with his team when things weren't going well. And he would go on these ego tantrums where he felt like he needed to be the man, which was the complete opposite from what we saw as the humble kid from Humball, Texas, when he first entered the league. So in short, I didn't like the Jimmy Butler trade when it was first announced. In fact, I was actually pretty pissed off about it. But at the same time, I almost get why the front office did. It was pretty clear Jimmy didn't want to be in Chicago. And as much as you don't want to just let your best player go, when it's clear that you're not going to win a title with him, you see what you can do to get the best value for him. Now, for those that don't remember, this trade was with the Timberwolves in exchange for Zach Levine, Chris Dunn, and the Wolves' number seven pick, which the Bulls used to select Lowry Markin. And in Initially, this trade looked pretty suspect because Levine, although looking like a player, you know, with a lot of potential, he had just torn his ACL and wouldn't even be available to play right away at the start of that season. Chris Dunn was the number five draft pick going into his second season, but had a pretty underwhelming rookie year for being a top five selection. And then marketing, nobody had really ever heard about him. But fast forward to now, and yes, Dunn didn't work out, although I still maintain he would have been a better option to keep over someone like Valentine. Markkinen looked really Really promising initially but has since struggled but Zach Levine bounced back from his ACL injury and continued getting better year after year and is now an all-star still with upside potential being only 26 years of age and yes Butler has gone on to have himself a nice career especially last season after leading the heat to the finals in the bubble but he's also continued to have chemistry issues inconsistent play and of course He's now in his 30s, while Levine is still a much younger piece that you can now build around. And I think when you look at the trade, Levine for Butler, straight up, and the fact that you got a star player in Levine for another star player, but a more disgruntled one and who is older, I think the Bulls ultimately won that trade. At number three, the Nikola Vucevic trade. Yes, I am including the most recent trade that was made at the deadline when the Bulls traded Wendell Carter Jr., Otto Porter, and two first round picks in exchange for Nikola Vucevic and Al Farouk Amino. I know there are a, a lot of people, a lot of chatter that has been going around among Bulls fans and even just general NBA fans, whether the Bulls won or lost this trade, especially after the Bulls missed the playoffs anyway, and also didn't keep their first round picks since it did not fall into the top four. And I made a whole separate video on this topic on why the Bulls did not lose the Vucevic trade. So I won't go into this trade into too much detail here since I covered it there. But essentially, anytime you're able to get a star big man on a fairly friendly contract for his level of production, all for a young center who has been injury prone and underwhelming for the Bulls and two first round picks in a crapshoot NBA draft, and the picks were still top four protected, 
you did not lose that trade, not for an established player, an all-star player, a guy who was averaging 25 and 12. In my view, the trade made sense for both sides given the Magic are in full rebuild mode and the Bulls realize they need to start maximizing Levine's prime and building around him. This was arguably one of the biggest moves the Bulls have ever traded for in terms of actually bringing in a big name. Generally, the Bulls are always trading away the bigger names and this was for the first time I've ever seen the Bulls finally acting like a big market team and making a big move at the trade deadline. At number two, the Dennis Rodman trade. Yes, that's right. Most people do not realize that Dennis Rodman was actually traded to the Bulls. He was not a free agent signing. Now, in 1995, after Michael Jordan's return midseason from baseball, the Bulls fell to the Orlando Magic in the second round, and it was clear that the absence of Horace Grant was weighing on them from the previous three title runs. And oddly enough, Horace Grant was actually playing for the Magic. So that offseason, the Bulls sought out another power forward who was a good defender and rebounder. And Robin's trade value was pretty low at the time, given all of his off the court issues. But Jerry Krause felt that with the right coach and the right teammates to get him back on track, that they would be able to get the best out of Dennis Rodman. And the Bulls pulled off one of the biggest steals of a trade ever in trading for Dennis Rodman for their backup center, Will Perdue. Yes, Will Perdue. The Bulls were able to bring in one of the best defenders and rebounders in NBA history for Will Perdue. Dennis Rodman, who was crucial to the second three-peat and the Bulls' third best player, all of this again for Will Perdue. This is an incredible trade and paid off handsomely for the Bulls. And then finally at number one, the 1987 draft night. Although Scottie Pippen start out and played most of his career in Chicago, he wasn't in fact drafted by the Bulls. In 1987, the Seattle Supersonics selected Scottie Pippen with the number five overall pick, but was quickly traded with Jerry Krause having his eye on trading up into the draft to snag Pippen. So the Bulls traded their number eight pick selection of Old and Polly Nice, a 1988 second round pick and a 1989 first round pick to the Sonics in order to move up to get Scottie Pippen, which is kind of a lot when you think about it just to move up three spots in the draft. But of course, it was well worth it as Pippen went on to be a perennial all-star, a seven-time All-NBA player, a 10-time All-Defensive Team player, and of course, a six-time NBA champion. And without him, the Bulls likely wouldn't have come close to winning that many titles. As great as Michael Jordan was and will always be the GOAT, he would not have been able to do everything he did without Scottie Pippen by his side. And because Olden Pauline nice really just ended up becoming a journeyman throughout the league and you compare what he was able to do versus what Scottie Pippen did in his career this has to be one of the best draft night trades ever in NBA and the best trade the Chicago Bulls have made in franchise history I want to know what you guys think though what are your thoughts on these trades how would you rank these would you move anything around and have it look differently were there any that i potentially missed let me know in the comments and as always be sure to subscribe as i post daily bulls content thanks again for tuning in guys and i will catch you in the next one